This is an NBC News special report. Here's Tom Yamas. And good day. We are coming on the air ahead of President Joe Biden's remarks to the nation on the end of America's longest war. The last U.S. soldier left Afghanistan nearly 24 hours ago. This is the image right here, ending the 20-year conflict. The withdrawal turns the country over to the Taliban as new video shows them surveying the inoperable U.S. military equipment, taking selfies, all of this left behind at the airport, following the largest airlift in U.S. history. We want to bring in NBC White House correspondent Mike Memoli right now to give us a preview of what we expect from President Biden before he's starting his remarks. Mike? Well, Tom, in a written statement last night, the president said that the decision to end the U.S. evacuation of American and Afghan allies was unanimous from his Joint Chiefs and from the commanders on the ground. But we know this. The decision that the president made in April to end the 20-year mission in Afghanistan was not unanimous. In fact, the president's facing criticism not only from Republicans, but some of his Democratic allies who are calling for investigations in the coming months about just how this evacuation final process was handled. So expect the president today to do what what he's been doing consistently over the course of the last two and a half weeks to explain and to defend the decision he made to end the U.S. mission in Afghanistan, but to explain as well the now the path forward, what is now a diplomatic mission to continue to keep pressure on the Taliban, which is now effectively the governing body in Afghanistan. And we have some new information as well just in the last few moments, speaking with officials about what is the U.S. presence still okay, on the Mike, ground. But thank now you. Here now is the president. He's about to start his remarks. 20 years of war in Afghanistan, the longest war in American history. We completed one of the biggest airlifts in history with more than 120,000 people evacuated to safety. That number is more than double what most experts thought were possible. No nation, no nation has ever done anything like it in all of history. The only the United States had the capacity and the will and the ability to do it, and we did it today. The extraordinary success of this mission was due to the incredible skill, bravery, and selfless courage of the United States military and our diplomats and intelligence professionals. For weeks, they risked their lives to get American citizens, Afghans who helped us, citizens of our allies and partners and others on board planes and out of the country. And they did it, facing a crush of enormous crowds seeking to leave the country. And they did it, knowing ISIS-K terrorists, sworn enemies of the Taliban, were lurking in the midst of those crowds. And still, the women and men of the United States military, our diplomatic corps, and intelligence professionals did their job and did it well, risking their lives, not for professional gains, but to serve others, not in a mission of war, but in a mission of mercy. 20 service members were wounded in the service of this mission. 13 heroes gave their lives. I was just at Dover Air Force Base for the dignified transfer. We owe them and their families a debt of gratitude we can never repay, but we should never, ever, ever forget. In April, I made a decision to end this war. As part of that decision, we set the date of August 31st for American troops to withdraw. The assumption was that more than 300,000 Afghan national security forces that we had trained over the past two decades and equipped would be a strong adversary in their civil wars with the Taliban. That assumption that the Afghan government would be able to hold on for a period of time beyond military drawdown turned out not to be accurate. But I still instructed our national security team to prepare for every eventuality, even that one. And that's what we did. So we were ready when the Afghan security forces, after two decades of fighting for their country and losing thousands of their own, did not hold on as long as anyone expected. We were ready when they and the people of Afghanistan watched their own government collapse and the president flee amid the corruption and malfeasance, handing over the country to their enemy, the Taliban, and significantly increasing the risk to U.S. personnel and our allies. As a result, 
to safely extract American citizens before August 31st, as well as embassy personnel, allies and partners, and those Afghans who had worked with us and fought alongside of us for 20 years. I had authorized 6,000 troops, American troops, to Kabul to help secure the airport. As General McKenzie said, this is the way the mission was designed. It was designed to operate under severe stress and attack, and that's what it did. Since March, we reached out 19 times to Americans in Afghanistan with multiple warnings and offers to help them leave Afghanistan, all the way back as far as March. After we started the evacuation 17 days ago, we did initial outreach and analysis and identified around 5,000 Americans who had decided earlier to stay in Afghanistan, but now wanted to leave. Our Operation Allied Rescue ended up getting more than 5,500 Americans out. We got out thousands of citizens and diplomats from those countries that went to into Afghanistan with us to get bin Laden. We got out locally employed staff from the United States Embassy and their families, totaling roughly 2,500 people. We got thousands of Afghan translators and interpreters and others who supported the United States out as well. Now we believe that about 100 to 200 Americans remain in Afghanistan with some intention to leave. Most of those who remain are dual citizens, longtime residents who had early decided to stay because of their family roots in Afghanistan. The bottom line, 90% of Americans in Afghanistan who wanted to leave were able to leave. And for those remaining Americans, there is no deadline. We remain committed to get them out if they want to come out. Secretary of State Blinken is leading the continued diplomatic efforts to ensure safe passage for any American, Afghan partner, or foreign national who wants to leave Afghanistan. In fact, just yesterday, the United Nations Security Council passed a resolution that sent a clear message about the international community expects the Taliban to deliver on moving forward, notably freedom of travel, freedom to leave. And together, we are joined by over 100 countries that are determined to make sure the Taliban upholds those commitments. It will include ongoing efforts in Afghanistan to reopen the airport, as well as overland routes, allowing for continued departure to those who want to leave and deliver humanitarian assistance to the people of Afghanistan. The Taliban has made public commitments broadcast on television and radio across Afghanistan on safe passage for anyone wanting to leave, including those who worked alongside Americans. We don't take them by their word alone, but by their actions. And we have leverage to make sure those commitments are met. Let me be clear. Leaving August the 31st is not due to an arbitrary deadline. It was designed to save American lives. My predecessor, the former president, signed an agreement with the Taliban to remove U.S. troops by May the 1st, just months after I was inaugurated. It included no requirement that Taliban work out a cooperative government arrangement with the Afghan government. But it did authorize the release of 5,000 prisoners last year, including some of the Taliban's top war commanders, among those who just took control of Afghanistan. And by the time I came to office, the Taliban was in its strongest military position since 2001 controlling or contesting nearly half of the country. The previous administration's agreement said that if we stuck to the May 1st deadline that they had signed on to leave by, the Taliban wouldn't attack any American forces. But if we stayed, all bets were off. 
So we're left with a simple decision. Either follow through on the commitment made by the last administration and leave Afghanistan, or say we weren't leaving and commit another tens of thousands more troops going back to war. That was the choice, the real choice, between leaving or escalating. I was not going to extend this forever war. And I was not extending a forever exit. The decision to end the military lift operations at Kabul airport was based on the unanimous recommendation of my civilian and military advisors, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and all the service chiefs and the commanders in the field. Their recommendation was that the safest way to secure the passage of the remaining Americans and others out of the country was not to continue with 6,000 troops on the ground in harm's way in Kabul, but rather to get them out through non-military means. In the 17 days that we operated in Kabul, after the Taliban seized power, we engaged in an around-the-clock effort to provide every American the opportunity to leave. Our State Department was working 24-7, contacting and talking, and in some cases, walking Americans into the airport. Again, more than 5,500 Americans were airlifted out. And for those who remain, we will make arrangements to get them out if they so choose. As for the Afghans, we and our partners have airlifted 100,000 of them. No country in history has done more to airlift out the residents of another country than we have done. We will continue to work to help more people leave the country who are at risk. And we're far from done. For now, I urge all Americans to join me in grateful prayer for our troops and diplomats and intelligence officers who carried out this mission of mercy in Kabul and at tremendous risk with such unparalleled results. An, air, an airlift that evacuated tens of thousands to a network of volunteers and veterans who helped identify those needing evacuation, guide them to the airport, and provided them for their support along the way. We're going to continue to need their help. We need your help, and I'm looking forward to meeting with you. And to everyone who is now offering, or who will offer, to welcome Afghan allies to their homes around the world, including in America, we thank you. I take responsibility for the decision. Now, some say we should have started mass evacuation sooner. And couldn't this have been done and been done in a more orderly manner? I respectfully disagree. Imagine if we've begun evacuations in June or July, bringing in thousands of American troops and evacuating more than 120,000 people in the middle of a civil war. There still would have been a rush to the airport, a breakdown in confidence and control of the government, and it still would have been very difficult and dangerous mission. The bottom line is there is no evacuation, evacuation from the end of a war that you can run without the kinds of complexities, challenges, and threats we faced. None. There are those who would say we should have stayed indefinitely for years on end. They ask, why don't we just keep doing what we were doing? Why do we have to change anything? The fact is, everything had changed. My predecessor had made a deal with the Taliban. When I came into office, we faced a deadline, May 1. The Taliban onslaught was coming. We faced one of two choices. Follow the agreement of the previous administration and extend it to have, or extend, to have more time for people to get out. 
or send in thousands of more troops and escalate the war. To those asking for a third decade of war in Afghanistan, I ask, what is the vital national interest? In my view, we only have one to make sure Afghanistan can never be used again to launch an attack on our homeland. Remember why we went to Afghanistan in the first place? Because we were attacked by Osama bin Laden and Al Qaeda on September 11th, 2001. And they were based in Afghanistan. We delivered justice to bin Laden on May 2nd, 2011, over a decade ago. Al Qaeda was decimated. I respectfully suggest you ask yourself this question. If we'd been attacked on September 11th, 2001, from Yemen instead of Afghanistan, would we have ever gone to war in Afghanistan? Even though the Taliban controlled Afghanistan in the year 2001? I believe the honest answer is no. That's because we had no vital interest in Afghanistan other than to prevent an attack on America's homeland and their fr our friends. And that's true today. We succeeded in what we set out to do in Afghanistan over a decade ago. Then we stayed for another decade. It was time to end this war. This is a new world. The terror threat has metastasized across the world, well beyond Afghanistan. We face threats from Al-Shabaab in Somalia, Al-Qaeda affiliates in Syria and the Arabian Peninsula, and ISIS attempting to create a caliphate in Syria and Iraq and establishing affiliates across Africa and Asia. The fundamental obligation of a president, in my opinion, is to defend and protect America. Not against threats of 2001, but against the threats of 2021 and tomorrow. That is the guiding principle behind my decisions about Afghanistan. I simply do not believe that the safety and security of America is enhanced by continuing to deploy thousands of American troops and spending billions of dollars a year in Afghanistan. But I also know that the threat from terrorism continues in its pernicious and evil nature. But it's changed, expanded to other countries. Our strategy has to change too. We will maintain the fight against terrorism in Afghanistan and other countries. We just don't need to fight a ground war to do it. We have what's called over the horizon capabilities, which means we can strike terrorists and targets without American boots on the ground, or very few if needed. We've shown that capacity just in the last week. We struck ISIS-K remotely, days after they murdered 13 of our service members and dozens of innocent Afghans. And to ISIS-K, we are not done with you yet. As Commander-in-Chief, I firmly believe the best path to guard our safety and our security lies in a tough, unforgiving, targeted, precise strategy that goes after terror where it is today, not where it was two decades ago. That's what's in our national interest. And here's a critical thing to understand. The world is changing. We're engaged in a serious competition with China. We're dealing with the challenges on multiple fronts with Russia. We're confronted with cyber attacks and nuclear proliferation. We have to shore up America's competitive to meet these new challenges in the competition for the 21st century. We can do both, fight terrorism and take on new threats that are here now and will continue to be here in the future. And there's nothing China or Russia would rather have, would want more in this competition in the United States to be bogged down another decade in Afghanistan.
As we turn the page on the foreign policy that has guided our, nas- our nation the last two decades, we've got to learn from our mistakes. To me, there are two that are paramount. First, we must set missions with clear, achievable goals, not ones we'll never reach. And second, we must stay clearly focused on the fundamental national security interest of the United States of America. This decision about Afghanistan is not just about Afghanistan. It's about ending an era of major military operations to remake other countries. We saw a mission of counterterrorism in Afghanistan, getting the terrorists and stopping attacks, morph into a counterinsurgency, nation building, trying to create a democratic, cohesive, and united Afghanistan, something that has never been done over many centuries of Afghan history. Moving on from that mindset and those kind of large-scale troop deployments will make us stronger and more effective and safer at home. And for anyone who gets the wrong idea, let me say it clearly. To those who wish America harm, to those who engage in terrorism against us or our allies, know this, the United States will never rest. We will not forgive, we will not forget. We'll hunt you down to the ends of the earth and we will, you will pay the ultimate price. And let me be clear, we'll continue to support the Afghan people through diplomacy, international influence and humanitarian aid. We'll continue to push for regional diplomacy engagement to prevent violence and instability. We'll continue to speak out for the basic rights of the Afghan people, especially women and girls, as we speak out for women and girls all around the globe. And I've been clear that human rights will be the center of our foreign policy. But the way to do that is not through endless military deployments but through diplomacy, economic tools, and rallying the rest of the world for support. My fellow Americans, the war in Afghanistan is now over. I'm the fourth president who has faced the issue of whether and when to end this war. When I was running for president, I made a commitment to the American people that I would end this war. Today, I've honored that commitment. It was time to be honest with the American people again. We no longer had a clear purpose in an open-ended mission in Afghanistan. After 20 years of war in Afghanistan, I refused to send another generation of America's sons and daughters to fight a war that should have ended long ago. After more than $2 trillion spent in Afghanistan, Costs that researchers at Brown University estimated would be over $300 million a day for 20 years in Afghanistan, for two decades. Yes, the American people should hear this, $300 million a day for two decades. You take the number of $1 trillion, as many say, that's still $150 million a day for two decades. And what have we lost as a consequence in terms of opportunities? I refuse to continue in a war that was no longer in the service of the vital national interest of our people. And most of all, after 800,000 Americans serving in Afghanistan, I've traveled that whole country, brave and honorable service. After 20,744 American servicemen and women injured, and the loss of 2,461 American personnel, including 13 lives, lost just this week. I refuse to open another decade of warfare in Afghanistan. We've been a nation too long at war. If you're 20 years old today, you've never known an America at peace. So when I hear that we could have, should have, continued the so-called low-grade effort in Afghanistan at low risk to our service members, 
at low cost. I don't think enough people understand how much we have asked of the 1% of this country who put that uniform on, willing to put their lives on the line in defense of our nation. Maybe it's because my deceased son, Bo, served in Iraq for a full year. Before that, well, maybe it's because of what I've seen over the years as senator, vice president, and president traveling these countries. A lot of our veterans and their families have gone through hell. Deployment after deployment. Months and years away from their families. Missed birthdays. Anniversaries. Empty chairs at holidays. Financial struggles. Divorces. Loss of limbs. Traumatic brain injury. Post-traumatic stress. We see it in the struggles many have when they come home. We see it in the strain on their families and caregivers. We see it in the strain on their families when they're not there. We see it in the grief borne by their survivors. The cost of war, they will carry with them their whole lives. Most tragically, we see in the shocking and stunning statistic that should give pause to anyone who thinks war can ever be low grade, low risk, or low cost. 18 veterans, on average, who die by suicide every single day in America. Not in a far off place, but right here in America. There's nothing low grade or low risk or low cost about any war. It's time to end the war in Afghanistan. As we close 20 years of war and strife and pain and sacrifice, it's time to look to the future, not the past. To a future that's safer. To a future that's more secure. To a future that honors those who served and all those who gave what President Lincoln called their last full measure of devotion. I give my word with all of my heart. I believe this is the right decision, a wise decision, and the best decision for America. Thank you. Thank you, and may God bless you all, and may God protect our troops. President Biden wrapping up his remarks on the pullout of Afghanistan, refusing to take questions, but standing his ground, defending the decision to leave Afghanistan and the August 31st deadline, saying it was, quote, designed to save American lives. Also saying we need to honor the mission that took 120,000 people out of Afghanistan, successfully airlifting them, including 6,000 Americans. I want to bring in back our NBC White House correspondent, Mike Memoli. Mike, what stood out for you and anything surprised you in those remarks? Well, Tom, by my count, this is the sixth time that the president has delivered extended remarks to the American people since the fall of Kabul on August 14th. And what we heard from the president today is much of what we had heard in those previous five times. It's clear that the conversation and the debate that the president and members of administration are most comfortable having is on this larger question of whether to extend and even to expand the U.S. military mission in Afghanistan. You heard the president refer to the agreement that was reached by his predecessor, by former President Donald Trump, with the Taliban, saying that he now was faced with the decision of whether to expand or to end the U.S. military mission. And ultimately, he made that decision to end it. But what I thought was interesting was what the president, in fact, led with. He acknowledged those chaotic, those messy, and yes, the tragic scenes that Americans have witnessed over the last two and a half weeks as the effort was made to evacuate as many Americans and as many of our Afghan allies as possible. He did say that under any scenario, when you saw the fall of a capital, when you 
you saw the end of a war, you were going to see chaotic scenes like the rush to the airport. He did acknowledge, again, a flawed assumption, as he put it, that the Afghan government that the U.S. had supported over the last 20 years would be able to withstand the Taliban surge for longer. But he reinforced this idea that because of the bravery of the U.S. military and because of their capacity to carry out this mission, this was largely a success, one of the most successful airlift evacuations in our history. But ultimately, what the president returned to was re reframing his broader foreign policy mission, which is reframing the debate of the 21st century as one between autocracies like Russia and China and democracies like the United States. And he said China and Russia would love nothing more than to see the U.S. continue to be bogged down in Afghanistan. He said the terror threat that we went to Afghanistan to confront has now metastasized beyond our borders. This is now a mission of diplomacy rather than deployments, Tom. Also saying the decision to pull out the troops is the best decision for America. I want to bring in NBC chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel, who's live for us in Doha, Qatar this day. Uh, you know, Richard, I have a question for you because the president also said what is vital to the nation and our interests is that Afghanistan can never be used again to be a launching pad for terrorism. But you've reported on this and even former CIA director Leon Panetta was talking about this today. That's not the case. That's not the reality in Afghanistan right now. The Taliban still with very close ties to all types of terror groups. Uh, we will see if Afghanistan ever again is used as a launch pad for, for terrorists, uh, but already uh, ISIS is accommodating with, uh, with the Taliban to a degree. I spoke to a Taliban commander and he said that their approach is going to be to fight ISIS, but also to bring them into the fold, to bring them into the ranks. Uh, Al-Qaeda still has very close uh, connections to, uh, to, Al uh, to, to the Taliban. Uh, they have fought side by side side together for the last 20 years and there are numerous reports that al-Qaeda leaders are going back in, going back home, uh, being welcomed in some cases as heroes back in Afghanistan. Then there is also the inspirational aspect uh, of all of this. It doesn't necessarily have to be that the next Osama bin Laden is sitting in Tora Bora, is sitting in Afghanistan. It is the example of what has just happened. The example that a small group of Islamist fighters can push out a superpower that could inspire the next bin Laden. So uh, Pr President Biden talked a lot about the, the this war being uh, yesterday's threat, that it had gone on too long, and a lot of Americans support leaving, uh, leaving Afghanistan. But he didn't talk very much about the current dangers, the current situation. Live, local, breaking news.